Now, let's start with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is actually a really, really complicated one. The plasma membrane is a really complicated one because a lot of people um, get confused, rightfully so. Um, the concept itself, uh, it takes a bit of time to explain. That's why there is a lot when it comes to the plasma membrane. Actually, what you guys need to learn is the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane, which is even more complicated. So according to the study design, you need to learn about the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane and its phospholipid bilayer nature. So let's start slowly through, let's start to explain each part, but slowly. First of all, the plasma membrane is essentially a membrane that surrounds a cell, a eukaryotic cell, right? The pla now the cell obviously has the nucleus, the nucleolus and its organelles in the cytoplasm, where the cytoplasm is the cytosol, which is the fluid, plus organelles. The plasma membrane itself maintains the structural integrity of the cell. So it has a really important function. And on top of that, it also controls, it controls the materials that can come in but also out of the cell. So as you can see, it plays a really, really important role for a cell. The plasma membrane pay, plays a super important role for the cell. But what is it made up of? Well, the plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. The phospholipid bilayer is essentially made up of units, which we call a phospholipid. A phospholipid is this molecule with a phosphate head, a polar phosphate head, and non-polar lipid tails. Now, the lipid tails are essentially a hydrocarbon chain. A hydrocarbon chain is non-polar, but the phosphate head is polar. Now, why am I mentioning non-polar and polar so often? Because you need to understand that this plasma membrane, obviously, like I showed you before, oops, uh, it's not working properly. Yep. This plasma membrane that I showed you before encapsulates it encapsulates all of the cell, right? It wraps around the cell. So let's assume it goes over the edges here. This is the nucleus, right? This is the extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid is the fluid between one cell and another cell, right? It's in between. The extracellular fluid is the fluid outside of the cell. Now, bear with me because it takes a bit of time to explain this. The fluid is primarily made up of water. Where water molecules themselves, again, we know the formula is H2O, are essentially oxygen atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Where the oxygen atom has a higher affinity for electrons. Therefore, the oxygen end will be a negative end. 
it will form a negative ball for the molecule. Whereas as it is attracting the electrons towards itself, it will leave the hydrogen nucleus exposed. Now we know the nucleus has protons and neutrons in it. The neutrons do not have a charge. The protons have a positive charge. Therefore, by exposing the nucleus of the hydrogen, the hydrogen side of the water molecule will be positively charged. It will be a positive, it will have a positive polarity, right? A positive pole. So this means that there is a permanent dipole formed with the water molecule. Now, why is that important? That is important because the phospholipid, which is the basic building block of the plasma membrane, is made up of a phosphate head and lipid tails. A phosphate head and lipid tails, where the phosphate head is polar, but the lipid tails are non-polar. Now, polar molecules are hydrophilic. That means water loving. There is also hydro there is also hydrophobic which means water hating where hydro means water and phobic means to hate therefore since the phosphate head it has affinity for water, it loves being surrounded by water, it will orientate itself towards water or where water is, that is in the extracellular environment and intracellular environment. It will or or orientate itself towards these two environments. That's why both on the outside of the plasma membrane and on the inside of the plasma membrane not on the inside both on the side surround facing the extracellular fluid and the side facing the intracellular fluid we look at phosphate heads and the lipid tails will be facing towards one another And since there is two layers of these phospholipids where the phosphate, he phosphate heads are orientating themselves towards water and the lipid tails towards themselves, a phospholipid bilayer is formed. So now we've covered the first main point according to the study design about the plasma membrane. The bilayer nature of the plasma membrane. Again, phospholipid bilayer. Now we know why it is a bilayer. We know why they are arranged in the way they are arranged. But there is a second component to what the study design dot point refers to, and that is the fluid mosaic model of it. Now you understand that the plasma membrane is a bilayer, but we still have uncovered why do we call it a fluid mosaic model. Now let's break down the very first part which is the fluid part of that statement. Why do we say that the plasma membrane is fluid? Well, remember these phospholipids, they are a phosphate head attached to two lipid tails where the phosphate head and the lipid tails are covalently bonded to one another, where covalent bonds are intra molecular forces of attraction, right? They are intramolecular bonding. It is intramolecular bonding. It is a really, really strong form of bonding. It takes a lot of energy to break those bonds. And they are very rigid. 
However, there is also something that we call intermolecular forces of attraction, that is forces of attraction between phospholipids themselves, between one phospholipid and the other phospholipid. These intermolecular forces of attraction are between molecules, right? Sometimes they can be dispersion forces, they can be dipolar pole bonding, hydrogen bonding, but in this case, let's focus on dispersion forces. Now, obviously, if you've had studied a bit of chemistry, this would probably make a lot more sense, but even if you haven't, that is all right. So this phospholipids which are adjacent to one another if you take a very close look they are really adjacent to each other let me zoom in to show you guys can you see how they are right next to each other the tails and the phosphate head as i said before those are covalently bonded it's really hard to break that bond but between these two phospholipids there is no covalent bonding it's intermolecular forces of attraction now that is really important because it means that these molecules are actually free to move, right? They are free to move, they are free to rotate, they are free to do whatever they want. Not to rotate, obviously they still have to maintain this orientation, but they are free to, again, uh, move around. So that helps us to understand the fluid part, the fluid statement, when the study's design mentions the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane. How about the mosaic part? Well, as you can see, the phospholipid bilayer, it's not just phospholipids. It's not just two layers of phospholipids. You can see that there are different kinds of proteins embedded into it. There is cholesterol, there are glycoproteins, channel proteins, carrier proteins, receptors, right? Everywhere. Therefore, it's like a mosaic. A lot of things are embedded on the plasma membrane for a very good reason, because they facilitate a lot of, uh, they carry out a lot of functions, really important ones, actually. Right, like the sodium-potassium pump. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is really important. And cholesterol as well. Let's start with cholesterol. Why is cholesterol embedded? That is cholesterol. That is cholesterol. Right? That's cholesterol. Actually, fun fact. The cholesterol that you see here is actually a steroid. A steroid is any molecule that has a ring structure. Right? It has that ring structure right there. Now, obviously, if you build upon that ring structure, you can make different types of steroids. For example, estrogen is a steroid. Testosterone is a steroid. A steroid is actually a general statement that refers to any molecule uh, that has that ring structure. Just a fun statement. And because it has a hydrocarbon ring structure, is actually the cholesterol molecule is actually a nonpolar molecule because it is a hydrocarbon, right? It has only dispersion forces. But that is the very same reason why it is embedded throughout the plasma membrane. And this is a beautiful thing, right? The way the cell is organized. The cholesterol is embedded in the plasma membrane to maintain the structural integrity of the plasma membrane. It reinforces those intermolecular forces of attraction between the lipid tails, maintaining again a rigid plasma membrane fluid but rigid at the same time right so it maintains that structural integrity of the cell itself how about the proteins some of you might ask if you heard me mention before i said something along the lines of a sodium potassium pump right i mentioned something along the lines of a carrier protein why well, the cell 
obviously is surrounded by this plasma membrane, but not every form of a molecule can actually go through there. Small molecules, sure, they can go through, but not large molecules, like glucose. And we're going to cover glucose later, uh, how photosynthesis and respiration occurs. Don't worry, we're going to cover that later. But our cells need glucose because glucose is broken down in the mitochondria in its source of energy, source of ADP. But it cannot go through the plasma membrane. That's the problem. It can't go through. So there are proteins embedded in the plasma membrane that carry out this function. They open up and close to allow molecules to go through the plasma membrane. And that's the function of a lot of the things that are embedded in the plasma membrane. A lot of these protein channels, carrier proteins, they aid in what we call facilitated diffusion or active transport. Now, facilitated diffusion and active transport are two different things. When I said facilitated diffusion, I meant that facilitated diffusion and active transport, they're not the same, but uh, proteins help with both of those functions. Now, since we are in the topic of diffusion, let's cover how molecules go through this plasma membrane. How do they go through this plasma membrane? Well, they go through this plasma membrane through what we call um, active or passive transport. Now, I'm trying to access my pen here, but obviously the, it's, it's being... Being a, the slides are being a bit annoying. So what is active and passive transport? Well, active and passive transport is essentially the transport of molecules according to or against the concentration gradient. So if there are a lot of molecules on one side of the plasma membrane, they will have a tendency by nature to go towards the other side from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now, this can be simple diffusion, so small molecules can literally go straight through there, that's fine. It can be facilitated diffusion with the aid of carrier, mole carrier proteins, or it can be active transport, where things are going against the concentration gradient and you need energy to do that in the form of ATP. But we're going to talk more about it later. Now, this was everything explained to you, but in the slide, right? So everything is there. I know it looks like a lot and it's probably quite a bit messy. Um, it's there for a reason. I did that for a reason, and that is to make it easier for you guys to understand what's happening, right? Because there is a lot to take in. Obviously, there are a bunch of slides here which will explain what I just said, but in writing. Now, obviously, I don't want to bore you guys to death by just reading through slides. I would, I prefer explaining myself through an image so i think that helps you guys more but let's let's go through some of the things that i didn't cover first of all a hydrophilic hydrophilic molecule and a lipophobic molecule are one and the same lipophobic lipophobic lipo means lipid phobic means to fear lipids hydrophilic means water loving you can either be water loving and lipophobic or you can be hydrophobic and lipophilic. You can't be hydrophobic and lipophobic because hydrophobic, you hate water. Lipophobic, again, the molecules hate lipids. So the molecule can't hate water and lipids at the same time. That would be a very strange molecule. Uh, right? So one or the other. Uh, most of the time, I would highly recommend you stick to the hydro stuff, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Uh, the, rather than use the word lipophilic and lipophobic, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that it's more popular to say hydrophilic, hydrophilic and hydrophobic.
what you see in the slides here is again the what you see in the slides is the phospholipid I think it's just a clearer image of what I explained before um, yeah so that the phosphate molecule and that that's, those are the saturated and unsaturated fatty acids now a quick mention here the difference between saturated and unsaturated saturated there are no double or triple bonds unsaturated means that there are double and triple bonds why do we call it unsaturated fatty acid we call it unsaturated because actually you can technically speaking break that bond over there and attach other stuff to it so, so just hydrogen and therefore make it a um You can make it a full hydrocarbon. Now, fun fact, uh, really fun fact. Unsaturated molecules um, actually are quite good for you. Um, unsaturated fatty acids, you can ask any doctor actually. Uh, they are really important um, because those are what we call omega-3 or omega-6 where omega is actually the last carbon and then we count backwards where omega-3 is the fact that there is a double bond located three carbons away from the last carbon or omega-6 there is a double bond located six carbons away from the last carbon so if you study chemistry you will be able to understand the naming of these molecules but yeah so um, fun fact, those are actually really important for you, more omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, right? So unsaturated fatty acids are good for you. Uh, the problem with them is because there is a double bond that their nature is actually quite unstable and therefore they can be very easily oxidized and they spoil very quick. That's why butter that you probably have in the fridge is primarily saturated because it can last longer, longer shelf life and lower perishable costs to the market that sells it. But not good for you. Anyways, um, it's all, uh, but, by the way, I promote a healthy diet. Um, it's healthy to eat a bit of anything and anything that your doctor consults you. But that was just a fun fact, right? Uh, consult with your doctor for anything else. <laughs> I'm not giving nutritional advice. I'm just saying fun fact, double bond makes it unsaturated and uh, unstable. But still, the healthy molecules actually have that double bond, which is very interesting to me. Um, oh yes, uh, before we continue, the glycerol molecule. So what you see here is a glycerol, these three carbons. Yep, we call that a glycerol. Don't forget that. You'll need it later, trust me. Now, again, this slide will re-emphasize what I said before, that it's a mosaic model. The plasma membrane has a mosaic model. There are protein channels, uh, glycoproteins, glycolipids. In this case, um, these glycolipids and glycoproteins, the glyco part stands for uh, glycogen. So it's essentially referring to the hydrocarbon chain that you see here. It's like a carbohydrate kind of chain, but not really. And that is used as a receptor by the cell to communicate with other cells, which personally I found epic. Um, but yeah, what else have I covered or not covered? Uh, nothing much. Cool. So that's pretty much it i think i covered everything in the first slide besides some small stuff now the function of the cholesterol is actually really, really important i did state it before that this is these hydrocarbon uh, rings uh, are what makes cholesterol a steroid and other things built on top of it to make testosterone and other hormones i guess But according to the Vika study design, it is actually very crucial for you guys, super crucial in, uh, for you guys to understand the function of cholesterol. It prevents them from aggregating and solidifying, thus maintaining the fluidity of the membrane. So they are super important, super, super important. 
The second function is that they maintain the integrity of the membrane by preventing the phospholipids from separating entirely, acting as a glue component. Again, it is immensely important for you guys to understand the function of cholesterol. Now let's spend let's spend a bit of time on transport, which I didn't want to spend a bit more time on the first slide uh, because I had the image right there, so it made it easy for me to explain. Um, but obviously, we didn't have that much space anymore, right? So we need to make up for it. We need to make up for it by explaining it on this slide. Um, so transport is really important. And again, I wish I could do it on the first slide again. Because you need to see it how it occurs with the plasma membrane. But let's go through each component individually. And maybe we can go back to the first slide and explain it there. So let's start with diffusion. Which is the passive net movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So try and focus on the box here. You can see these molecules diffusing out from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So it's just because of the random motion or the random movement of molecules just by nature that the fusion occurs. And as you can see, high concentration, low concentration, in equilibrium, they are dispersed everywhere. Now there is a difference between passive transport and active transport, and thank God for the image that we have here. So passive transport is the simple diffusion of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now, facilitated diffusion, it's still passive because molecules are flowing according to the concentration gradient. They're flowing according to the concentration gradient, not against it, according to it, right? They're flowing down the concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Facilitated diffusion just means that there are carrier or proteins or channel proteins that aid with molecules going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, right? Active transport, on the other hand, is the form of transfer, transport where ATP is used to, again, ATP is essentially an energy carrying molecule, um, but it's used to transport molecules against the concentration gradient from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Can you see the squares here? That's an area of low concentration. You have only two squares above, but you have four squares below. And this carrier molecule, apparently it's still, it's still transporting these squares on the inside of the cell. Why? What could be why why would this be important? What could potentially be so important that the cell needs to transport towards itself? Do you guys have any idea? The answer is food, like glucose, right? The cell needs a lot of it. It needs to store it sometimes uh, because glucose is a source of energy, right? So the cell needs to expend some ATP to get a ton of glucose in so it can produce, because remember, one molecule of glu glucose can produce 36 ATP. And don't worry, we're going to cover that, as you can see on the progress bar. We're going to cover that very soon. But that's why uh, that is really important. Now, let's look at some molecules that are transported through simple diffusion. Alcohols and steroids are the prime example. Because they can diffuse directly through 
the lipid bilayer. And another fun fact is the fact that alcohol can diffuse directly through the lipid bilayer that makes it such a dangerous drug, right? So alcohol, essentially, um, it can flow through the plasma membrane very easily, and therefore it can do the same thing between neurons, right? And essentially it can block sometimes transmission at the synapse of a neuron. And that's why it makes some people a bit more relaxed or some people a bit more agitated because it does actually affect the way your brain functions. And the, f the reason why it can do that so easily is because again, it can be transported so easily through the blood, right? And between cells. Now, what are other molecules that can obviously easily go through the plasma membrane? The, a very easy way to remember that is basically uh, think of the main molecules, right? Like oxygen, carbon dioxide, water. Those are like the main molecules that you kind of need. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, we inhale and exhale respectively and obviously water we need so those are the kinds of molecules that our bodies are designed in such a way to easily accept and get rid of facilitated diffusion as i said is the passive net movement of molecules across the plasma membrane via transport proteins this can be the sodium potassium pump right uh, or um, transport of calcium or glucose and amino acids now some of you might say, hey Ray, I understand why you would need um, channel proteins and carrier proteins to transport glucose and amino acids because those are massive molecules. Glucose is a, a hydrocarbon like C6H12O6, right? Uh, it contains basically 24 atoms in it. And amino acids are essentially, they have a central carbon with a functional group, an amino group, and an acid group attached to it. They are the building blocks of proteins. But they are very, very, very hard to transport as well because they're massive, right? So we understand why facilitated diffusion is needed to aid the transport of such large molecules. How about charged molecules? Well, charged molecules are super polar. They are really, really, really polar. I mean, you can't get more, more polar, right? It's an ion at this stage. So yes, uh, you need something like the sodium potassium pump to allow sodium and potassium to flow through. That is not potassium, by the way, that's calcium. But you also need calcium. Uh, think of your bones, they need calcium. Active transport, as I stated before, um, essentially refers to the fact that uh, in order to transport molecules against the concentration gradient, sometimes you need energy, expand energy, obviously, uh, because you're doing something against what naturally would happen. And the cell does that when it needs food, as I said. How about osmosis? Well, osmosis is the diffusion of water. That's it. It's the net movement of water molecules across a semi-permeable membrane from a region of high concentration of water to a region of low concentration of water. Now, another thing that we need to cover before we, we move towards my favorite, favorite, favorite part is the surface area to volume ratio. Um, the surface area to volume ratio, it's a very, I think you can learn it, you might be able to understand it more later, but essentially, uh, the higher the surface area to volume ratio, the easier it is to get molecules or substances towards the center or any, in any other part of the, um, in any other part of the cell, right? Because you can see as, um, 
the cell gets larger, the ser surface area to volume ratio actually gets significantly smaller, right? So it's harder to transport molecules from one corner of the cell towards the center. And because you need to, and because the cell needs to transport molecules continuously uh, close to the center, it needs a high surface area to volume ratio because that will make the job easier and more effective. So the cells have evolved to have an appropriate surface area to volume ratio. Actually, the higher the surface area to volume ratio, the better it is because um, the more efficient the transfer of molecules is. For example, Vili, a high surface area to volume ratio maximizes absorption of nutrients. And for those of you that don't know what Vili is, it's essentially um, what's line, it's like small hairs lining our intestines uh, and they're used to absorb as much food as possible. Now let's go through a couple of VR questions before we move on to photosynthesis and restoration. So, six molecules that form part of the plasma membrane of an animal cell are shown below. The R portions of the molecule are on the outer surface of the cell. Both the S and the R portions of the membrane are free to move within the membrane. C, the S portions of the molecules represent the hydrophilic fatty acid tails. D, the S and R portions of the molecule together allow for the easy transfer of amino acids. Can you guys take a guess which would be the right alternative? You can pause the recording before continuing. Um, but, the correct answer would be, drumroll please, the correct answer would be C. How about this question? Glucose can enter and exit the cells through the transport protein, GLUT1. When there is a higher concentration of glucose in the extracellular environment than the intracellular environment, the GLUT1 undergoes a conformational change from a T1 open state to a T2 closed state. This process is shown in the diagram below. This mode of transportation is a passive diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, or active transport. This should be a very, very easy question to answer. It's facilitated diffusion because it's moving along the concentration gradient. How about this question? The diagram below shows two different types of cells in epithelial tissue with different surface area to volume ratios. This one has a 2 to 1 surface area to volume ratio, this one has a 3 to 1 surface area to volume ratio. The columnar cell can absorb nutrients more effectively than the... So which one of the following is the most correct statement? The columnar cell can absorb nutrients more effectively efficiently than the squamous cell. The squamous cell completes metabolic processes more slowly than the columnar cell. The columnar cell is more likely to survive in its environment than the squamous cell, and the squamous cell can expel waste more efficiently than the columnar cell. Which one would be the correct answer? A, B, C, or D? I'll give you a moment to think about it. And the answer is D.